So, I have something I must admit. I have this secret. So, a couple of years ago, I discovered something about myself. More specifically, I discovered that I am actually a robot. <laughs> well, obviously, I'm not like a Lego robot. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm a robot. And so are all of you. And the cool thing about you guys being robots is that I can hack you. What does that mean? Well, it means I can hack your mind and control your behaviors, getting you to do pretty much whatever I want you to do. And chances are that at least one or two people in this audience has been hacked at some point in their lives. And you probably don't even know it. And I do realize this is a somewhat big claim to make. <laughs> Uh, so who am I to make it? Well, I started my career a decade ago as a software engineer, working for a startup company, building an app. And I still remember those long nights, exciting nights of work, and how exhilarating and also exhausting that launch day was, and how sweet it was when loads of people were downloading our app. And what I remember the best is that feeling I got a couple of months later when we went bankrupt. <laughs> it's okay, I've, I've gotten over it. So whilst we had been quite effective at getting people to download the app, turns out very few was actually using it. And even fewer kept on using it repeatedly over time. And as we soon discovered, products that people don't use do not make an awfully lot of money. <laughs> Hence the bankruptcy. So for months on end after that, I walked around really annoyed with all these ridiculously stupid users. <laughs> I see some of you smiling, you might have some of those too. <laughs> but after a while, it started dawning upon me that maybe, just maybe, the problem was not them. Maybe it was me. Incidentally, that's something my girlfriend has been telling me for years. <laughs> and what I realized is the, ha the hard thing about innovation, about making new products and services, is often not actually making the product or service, it's making people use the product or service. And I, uh, well, I was a bit young and naive back then, so I thought to myself, how cool would it be if we could program humans the same way we can program computers? I said, young and naive. <laughs> so I did the only rational thing for a 22-year-old. I quit my job, I sold pretty much everything I owned, and then I moved to England to become a psychologist. And a decade later, I'm serving as head of behavioral design at a uh, big Nordic bank. And tonight, I would like to share with you what I've discovered on this journey of mine. And I do realize that what I'm telling you might sound a little bit like science fiction. And you're completely correct about that. The science part, that is. Because it is just really simple cognitive neuroscience. And this is how it works. Imagine that you're in bed early in the morning, and suddenly your alarm clock goes off. And what happens in the brain when you hear that sound is the cluster of neurons associated with that specific sound lights up. So you lay there in bed thinking to yourself, what's that really annoying sound? <laughs> Before you reckon, it's probably my alarm clock. And as you do, a cluster of neurons associated with that specific concept of alarm clock lights up. And then you move your arm over and shut it off. And as you do, a cluster of neurons associated with that arm movement lights up. As I said, the brain is quite simple. And one interesting thing about it is that neurons that fire together they also wire together. They become connected. And as we keep on repeating this ritual morning after morning, these connections grow stronger and stronger, until one morning where the connections are so strong, it's enough for just the first cluster of neurons to activate, and the activation will automatically spread to the next one and to the next one. Kind of like dominoes, at which stage it's enough for you just to hear the sound of the alarm clock 
and you will automatically, subconsciously, without thinking about it, move your arm over and shut it off. We could say that you develop a small computer program in your brain by this time, or an automatic behavior. In psychology, we call it automaticity. But you can think of it as autopilot, because that's essentially what it is. And studies suggest that we humans make roughly 50 to 95% of all our decisions based on autopilots. And this is how it works out. So you're lying there in bed, you just shut off your alarm, and as you rest your hands on the clock, you get this sensation in your hand, right? And that might be the trigger for the next behavior, the next program, which is removing the duvet, putting one foot out of bed, and then stumbling into the bathroom. And as you get to the bathroom, you catch a glimpse of the shower or the bathtub. And that might be the trigger for the next program that has you automatically stripping down and jumping in. And this is how the morning goes. You trigger program after program after program until suddenly you find yourself sitting in your car on your way to work. And that's when you realize that you can't remember if you turned off the oven. <laughs> Or if you lock the front door. Or even if you hit somebody with your car for the last 20 minutes. <laughs> because you've been on autopilot. As I said, we humans are to a great extent robots. And while some people might find this a little bit creepy, the first thought that appeared in my mind as an engineer was, gee, I wonder what we might use that for. <laughs> And I'm glad you asked, because I have some uh, quite creepy applications of this insight to show you. So a quick show of hands. How many of you use Bing? Bing? <laughs> Surprise, right? Google uh, for your search engine. Of course, the Googlers have it. I already knew that. I said, you're robots. <laughs> so why do we use Google? Is it because Google is a better product? Well, studies suggest that in terms of search results, they're quite equal. Is it then that Google is better at marketing? They get better at getting the word out there. Can you really remember the last time you saw an advertisement for Google search engine? Probably not yet. What actually happens is this. When you have a question, when you're curious about something, a cluster of neurons lights up in your brain. And we all know how it goes from here. So you automatically bring up your phone and go on Google. It's autopilot. Turns out, Google has hacked us all. Now, if you wanted to make a search engine to compete with Google, obviously, it would not be enough just to make some computer software. You would also have to make some mental software. More specifically, you would have to figure out a way to take that mental trigger away from Google. There's only one small problem with that which is a thousand years of psychological development. <laughs> to make a new program and take that trigger away from Google, you actually have to activate it. And when you do, you activate a pre-existing program, which is going on Google. It's almost impossible to steal a trigger once it first has been taken. Thus, owning one of these might be the ultimate competitive advantage in business in this day and age. It's kind of creepy, isn't it? And if you, if you think that's creepy, you'll find these guys positively terrifying. It's with good reason this is the most valuable company on the planet today. So imagine this. You're standing in the kitchen, you just got the kids out, and you have a bunch of dirty dishes, when you realize that you're out of dishwashing soap. What do you do? Well, of course, you could bring up your phone and go on Amazon and search for dishwashing soap, and then evaluate it based on price and quantity and quality and so on, and buy dishwashing soap. But in psychology, we know that the more complex a behavior is, the less likely it is of becoming automatic, of becoming subconscious. Which means that whenever somebody wants to buy dishwashing soap, they will have to think consciously about it. And to Amazon, that's a problem. Because when we think consciously, we use the conscious mind, the explorative mind that's open to considering options, such as just buying it off the local supermarket. Obviously, Amazon doesn't want that. So what do they do? 
Well, they create this thing, they call a dash button. You just click it, and then uh, some, by some magic, soap appears at your door a couple of hours later. The brilliance about what they're doing here is actually that they're replacing a complex behavior with a simple one. And it only takes a couple of clicks for this to become automatic, to go subconscious. Now imagine that you're a traditional physical retailer or online shop. By the time your customer becomes fully consciously aware that they need a certain product, they've already bought it subconsciously off Amazon by clicking the button. How do you compete with that? What Amazon is doing is effectively blocking their competition out of the customer's mind and thereby the marketplace. So it seems the rules of the marketplace is changing. We used to compete on value proposition, making the best product. Now we also have to compete on controlling user behavior. And this is a winner-takes-it-all game, where the company who owns the mental trigger takes a majority of the market share, leaving scraps for the rest of us. And this is not limited to retail anymore. Recently, I've seen scale-ups moving into telecom, finance, shipping, aviation, and so on. Whilst these companies might be small today, what we can learn from retail is that the companies who do this well, they go big quite fast. Which is great news if you're a consumer. And also if you're a company. That is, if you're the company doing it. If not, it's quite scary. The good news, though, is that behavioral design is still kind of like internet in 1995. Few are aware it even exists, and even fewer are able to see what it's quickly becoming. But for those lucky few who do, there are fortunes to be made. And as of right now, you have become among the lucky few. Internet in 1995 was all about getting the best domain names. Well, behavioral design is all about getting the best mental triggers. Like that feeling of curiosity that Google owns. Well, luckily for us, humans have a lot more emotions than that. So there is a lot more potential free triggers out there in the market for us to take. But like domain names, mental triggers are not made equal. Some of them are a lot more worth than others. Probably a handful is worth the same as the rest of them combined. And some of these are already taken. For your product, there might only exist a handful, or maybe just one trigger that's relevant. Which leads me to my question for you, which is, which trigger are your product or service dependent upon to become successful and stay successful? And how are you planning on taking that before your competitor does? And by now, you're probably realizing there is a bit more to behavioral design than what I've just shown you the last 14 minutes. And it's actually a job to do it. Someone else's job, that is. Luckily, I have a hack. After all, I hack minds, that's what I do. <laughs> so what I learned when I was outside of the Nordics is that actually many of these big design disciplines, such as service design and co-design and so on, was pioneered right here. It means that some of the best designers on the planet are already working in our companies. Your job is to plant this seed of behavioral design in their mind. In the mind of the service designers, the user experiments designers, and the product owners in your companies. Just send them an email and tell them what you just learned that the hard thing is often not actually making a product, it's making people use it. And how cool would it be if we could hack the user's mind to actually use it? So that they can go and discover behavioral design for themselves. And if we do, imagine the Amazon or Google-sized wealth we could create for our companies and our society as a whole.
That was my time. Thank you.